Father, perhaps more than anything, we just want to say thank you for all the weeks and months which have led to today and to the events that are about to take place next week. We thank you for bringing us here, for the many and various ways in which you led us to this place. We thank you for the gift of new friends, new brothers and sisters. We thank you for the work of your spirit, opening our minds and our eyes and our hearts. We thank you for the anticipation of what it is that's about to take place next week, the events which will happen in the lives of all these, my brothers and sisters, to be baptized, to be confirmed, to feast on the body and blood of your son for the first time. Lord, we ask that you would enable us to continually understand a bit more profoundly what it is that Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross. Let this be the greatest week of our lives. We give tonight to you, we ask your blessing upon it, our conversation, that you'd continue to take us deeper into the mysteries of your son's passion, death, and resurrection and show us how it is that we should respond. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A um, couple things, just as, uh, as we begin. Um, um, one is to say that though this is the last uh, Thursday night we'll have a chance to be together before Easter, um, we're not done after tonight. <laughs> so um, we do, uh, we'll, we'll continue to meet for a few weeks after Easter, and um, that's, in, in my mind, that's really every bit as important as what we're doing right now. Uh, it, it goes by a, um, I won't even tell you the name it goes by, it's irrelevant. Um, but the intention is to try to do everything we can to uh, continue to help you uh, get incorporated into the parish. You, you might have noticed this OLGC is big. And so uh, the challenge of um, coming into the church after an experience like this is oftentimes one of, what you need? Yeah, how about we do that uh, right when I'm done? Can we do that as we just break? Bob's got a sign-up meal for the Seder, so um, yeah, great. So, um, yeah, it's, the challenge is we go through this experience, and a lot of us have made some really strong connections and deep friendships. And we've just, uh, a couple of us were talking about this a minute ago. And then it's about to end. And so we, we have to do everything we can to continue to forge community and to stay together in different ways. And so we'll talk about how that's going to happen afterwards. But we just want to present some things to you and continue to give the experience of not just being, you know, kind of like dissolved into a place with 12,000 people in it. That's the first thing. Second thing just to say is uh, I just want to tell you personally what a gift it's been to walk with all of you over the last uh, number of months. Um, you, you win the prize for the most inquisitive group in 22 years of my life. Um, but it's great. I love it. And uh, it really has been a, a gift to pray with you, for you, uh, walk with you. Uh, I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to next week. And then just looking forward to seeing what God's going to do in you and through you as um, you take your place in, uh, in the people of God. So tonight what I want to do is try to um, prepare us for next week. So I'm going to try to condense a whole set of things that I, I, I'm probably going to preach on in one way or another um, but I, I just want to orient us into the mysteries of Holy Week. So you're all going to be, please God, at the 4 o'clock Saturday, okay? So we would beg you to be there if you can. Some of you can't, that's fine, we understand. Get there on Sunday. But we want to do it because, so 4 o'clock, uh, the 4 o'clock Mass on Saturday is uh, the beginning of Holy Week. It's Palm Sunday. We actually process into the church, and we're going to have you process with us uh, as priests as we're walking in. There's nothing to prepare for. I don't want you to worry about anything like that. The, the point of next week is not that there are ceremonies that we are celebrating. They are events that are happening. That's what's taking place. 
So I don't want you to worry about getting lost in logistics. Um, we'll tell you everything you need to do, all right? I just want you to be able to enter more fully into the mysteries that we celebrate and to understand better the actions that are going to take place. So Palm Sunday begins the great week or holy week. And we're going to hear the passion uh, as it's proclaimed in the Gospel of Mark. And then I'm, I'm going to beg you to do everything you can to come, not just next Saturday night, that is for the Easter Vigil, but Thursday and Friday as well. So Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, they're really one day. So Holy Thursday, um, Good Friday, and then the Vigil on Holy Saturday. So Holy Thursday, we begin, Kathy, are we at 7 or 7.30? 7.30 on Holy Thursday? I'm dead without her. What's my middle, what's my date of birth? Three-digit code on the back. Um, um, so 7.30 next Thursday night, it's the celebration of the institution of the Eucharist. Uh, it really cap, it begins these three remarkable days that we'll celebrate. And then on Friday, um, we're in the church a lot of the afternoon. Um, a lot of people are working, totally get that. We have three natural breaks in the course of the various services that are going on on, Holy, on Good Friday. So just take a look at the website and get there for as much as you can, I would beg you. And then Saturday night, there's 52 people coming into the church. There's 14 baptisms. We're going to be here a while. So um, I'm going to look like a prune. <laughs> I'm going to wear a wetsuit in the font. Um, 49, we just lost three? What'd you do? Oh, you prayed. Okay, great. Um, so maybe we're 46 by the time we're done with tonight. So roughly 50, okay? So... Um, Yeah, we'll be there a while. So uh, it's a remarkable, remarkable night. So I want to try to help us understand how to get into and uh, prepare for and pray about Holy Week. So let me give you a couple images. I want to give you a couple images, and I want to give you a, a set of scriptures to pray with. And we'll let that be the night. So here's the, the, the first image. The first image would be um, June 6, 1944. Anybody know what it is? It's not my birthday, no. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know I'm getting grayer, but um, <laughs> I was negative 21 June 6, 1944, just to be clear. <laughs> Mom and Dad hadn't even met yet. What's June 6, 1944? Yeah, D-Day, right? So what happens on D-Day? Yeah, invasion of Normandy, right? So the Allies land at the beaches in Normandy. Why'd they go there? Did they go to see the Louvre? Hang out at the beaches at Cannes? Yeah, so, so the, but the essence of landing was for what purpose? Delivery. All right. So D-Day presupposes not just allies occupied France, but the allies occupied France and Nazi Germany, right? With me? D-Day presupposes a tyrant. So that's, that's an image I would suggest we have in mind as we enter into Holy Week. Because the events that we're about to celebrate are not some sort of tragic, unfortunate consequences that Jesus suffered. They're the explicit purpose for which he came. So Jesus comes for this week. Another way to say that, sticking with the, the point of the analogy, Jesus comes to invade. The purpose of the second person of the Trinity becoming flesh is to invade a kingdom. Jesus did not come to tell stories. And he did not come to preach. And he did not come to, to, to perform miracles, although he did all of those things. Jesus came to liberate and to take back what is rightfully his we're accustomed to simply hearing the, the, um, 
the word as if it's the, the simple ending of a prayer through Christ our Lord. But to call Jesus Lord is not simply to say a nice conclusion to a prayer. It's to declare a reality. And there are two lords. They're not of equal power. They're not rivals. One's a creature. One's the creator. And you and I belong to one or the other. Who's getting baptized? Hold them high. So those of you who are going to get baptized, here's how I would encourage you to prepare for next week. Prepare as if you are packing. As if you're moving. Because you are. You're moving out of the house of a tyrant into the house of a father. That's the event that's taking place. Those of us who've been baptized, that's the event that took place. But Jesus is going to reclaim you. That's why this is no empty ceremony. He's going to steal back what is properly his, i.e. you. So flip with me. Let's look through a couple scriptures to, to see this, okay? Flip first. Flip to John 18. John 18, starting in verse 3. Who's there? Anybody got it? John 18, verse 3. Joe, you got it? 170? Read it real loud, will you? 18.3. Uh, okay. So this is Holy Thursday night, what we now call Holy Thursday night, right? So we just want to understand this scene. I just want to weave us through a series of scriptures to see what's, what it is that's going to be um, commemorated next week and the events that are going to take place in our lives, especially those of us who are going to be baptized. And then those of us who've already been baptized to try to understand more fully what took place and to make sure that we're living in the right house, all right? Because there's only two houses. So it's Holy Thursday night. Jesus has just celebrated what's now going to be called the Last Supper. He's left. He's already told the disciples they're all going to abandon him. And he heads into what we now know as the Garden of Gethsemane, which is still there. I've been there. The trees that are there are probably third generation from the time of Jesus. It's, what, first century, right? There's no electric lights. It's a full moon. That's the only light in the sky. Judas, who has decided to betray him, right, comes sneaking up on Jesus with guards carrying torches. You think so? Not a chance. So picture, here's Jesus. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas is coming across the valley over there to sneak up on Jesus Carrying lanterns and torches. Right? That's not what happened. Can't possibly be what happened. I'd suggest that what's happening here is John is writing dramatically. All this takes place in, in what? A, a cow pasture? A, a building? What, where is this taking place in? It's a garden. Right? Any other gardens you can think of in Scripture? Eden, right. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Man rebelled, right? The consequence of which was death by our own choosing. Man rebelled and we, we sold ourselves into slavery as a race, as a result of that. And there's no way out. You cannot get out of this. You can't try harder, do better, as a result of that, the entire human race lives under the kingdom or the dominion of capital S, sin, and capital D, death. The proof of, of that? You do things you hate, even though you try hard not to do them. The things you want to do, you struggle with, and you'll die. 
and there's nothing you can do about it. That's a kingdom against which you and I are powerless. So John's writing this as if to say the idea behind the lanterns and the torches are watch this. Watch this scene. Notice what's happening here. Because here is the new Adam, Jesus, again in a garden, who is now being obedient, and the result is going to be life for the entire human race, liberation for the entire human race. The dramatic rescue of what is properly God's. With me so far? Okay. All right. Flip to Luke 22. I just want to look real quickly at what's going on in this garden. What is it? 106? 136. Great. 2244. What's your translation read? He was in such agony. Anybody got a different translation? Anybody? Bueller? Sorry. What translation have you got? So read it again. Being just in agony. Anybody got another translation? Who's got that? Being in an agony. So that's actually what it is. Jesus is not in agony. Jesus is in an agony. That's kind of a weird way of saying it, right? So here, this is going to look... Jesus has been so composed, collected, strong all throughout his life. All of a sudden, here he is. He's sweating blood. And it looks like he's simply cowering in fear. This is not what's happening, people. So the word that's translated here, agon in Greek, is the word that means a place of assembly, which later becomes um, a place of competition, which later means a stadium. It's related to the word athletos, which is an athlete. This is not a man cowering in fear. This is the greatest athlete of all time engaging in a decisive battle for the fate of the human race. He's in an, he enters into an arena. Anybody know what LeBron James does before a game? Yeah, he walks out the half court, hands in chalk, right? Talcum. What's that supposed to indicate? Yeah, look at me. Bring it. Game on. That's Jesus. I, one of the things I think the Lord wants to give us is a new set of glasses, lenses, to see what it is that's going on in the Passion. This is, this is not a man being hunted. Not at all. This is God in disguise engaging in battle. Flip to 1 John 3. First John 3, 8. Anybody there? Page? 367? What you got, Kristen? Right. The reason the Son of God came. The reason the Son of God came was to destroy the works of the devil. Flip to Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 29 to 30. Who's there? 34. Page 34. 
No one want to read it? How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. This is Jesus describing what he's come to do, people. Who's the strong man? Yeah, Satan, right? What are the goods that he has secured? Us, <laughs> right? Jesus has come to liberate, to rescue, to free, and he's doing it by going to battle. All right, so someone once said, um, the place of the Christian life is not on a cloister. The place of the Christian life is on a battlefield. This is a war which is taking place in the week that we're about to enter into. Flip to Colossians chapter 1. When you get a page, yell it out. Three hundred. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. This is God. God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Those of you who had your hands raised who are getting baptized, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be delivered from one kingdom to another. It's not just that you're going to get wet, although you will get wet, trust me. You're moving. You're changing address. You're changing families. You're changing lords. The, the sober truth, for those of you who are not baptized, is you have no power in you to resist the enemy. That's the state of the human condition without God. God's going to change that. Next chapter, Colossians 2. Second half of verse 13. And you, God made alive together with him, with Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses, having canceled the bond which stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, or we could say, having obliterated the bond which stood against us with its legal demands. Here's the first thing. Jesus on the cross is doing two things, people. The first thing he's doing is he's, he's, he's absorbing into his flesh your sin and mine. Paul writes in um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, um, that God makes Jesus to be sin. We don't even have a clue what that means. But the Lord takes into himself all of the sins of the entire human race. All your sin, all mine. It's played out on his body. He doesn't atone for it with a, a magic wand. He doesn't atone for it by sending an angel to fight. He atones for it by himself being ripped to shreds. As one of the um, writers in the early church used to say, if you don't... When we look at the cross and we're perplexed, like, why did God have to endure that? The author would say... Be that just shows that we do not grasp the enormity of sin. So that's the first thing he's doing. He's taking my place, your place. He's there as a substitute for me. He's making atonement for me. He's making me right with the Father. Out of his love. Okay? But Paul goes on, he's doing more than that. He disarmed, this next passage, or next verse, this, verse 15. He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them, 
triumphing over them in him or in his cross. These principalities and powers, what are these? Sin, death, all that belongs to the evil one's kingdom. What Paul says is he has stripped them, disrobed them, humiliated them, defanged them. He's made a mockery of them. They no longer have any power over you or me. And he parades them behind him. So in the ancient world, when the Romans would go into, uh, you know, some entity and they would conquer it, then they would come back to Rome. And as they would come back to Rome, the general, the army would come at the head of a procession and behind the general would be all the captives that they've taken back. All in chains. Including the king of whatever country that they've ransacked. That's the image that Paul's writing with here. Jesus is leading a procession. See, we have this image of the Lord in our heads, so many of us anyway. He was just kind of like a nice guy. He was a good man. What a tragic event. He was so kind. Wow. What a shame. He just couldn't, he couldn't protect himself. Thanks be to God, he is kind, he is good, he's not nice. But what God wants to open our eyes to is the extraordinary power of the Lord of the universe who out of love for you and me camouflages himself as a man to fight for you and me. Jesus doesn't cower in fear at anybody or anything. Things bend their knee at his name, not the other way around. And so the Lord is leading Satan and death and sin in a mockery behind him, saying, I have conquered them. I am Lord, only Lord. And these no longer threaten you. They have no power over you. They can't rule in you anymore because I have freed you. Yes, you struggle because you have habits, you got memories, I got boatloads of both. But they have no power over you anymore. I'm here to tell you, you can win now. Not by trying harder, but by letting my spirit take over in your life. The spirit that raised me from the dead, which enables me to, to lead these things behind me now in procession. Just like you're going to hear on Holy Saturday night, Moses more or less taunt the Egyptian army, which is an image again of Satan and of all his hosts that try to harass us. And he's going to taunt them by saying to the Israelites, look at them, those people that have chased you all your life, and understand that after today you will never, ever see them again because God is fighting for you, and they are going to drown. And so it will be for those of you who walk into the waters of baptism. So it was for those of us who just went through second baptism, which is what the church is always called confession. That happened again. All those enemies that have chased us for decades, for some of us, they're drowned. They're gone. They have no hold on you anymore. These are realities we're talking about, not poetry. This is what God does. It's what he did in his passion. It's what he does through the sacraments, which all flow from his side. You with me? Okay. Flip to Ephesians 2. It's back the other way. Somebody got a page? 287. And you he made alive when you were dead through the trespass, trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among these, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh following the desires of body and mind, and so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved 
and raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So we all lived once under this dominion. It is crucial, folks, if we're going to understand this week, to understand this. We need to know what is the situation of the world in which we live. You and I live in occupied territory. We live in France pre-June 6, 1944. But a liberator has come. He has invaded a kingdom. And he's done it out of love for you and out of love for me to take back what is his. Not his in the sense of some possession. His in the sense of that which he has made in his own image and likeness, which he's made for friendship. Which has been unable to live the way he intended us to live because we've been enslaved because of the result of the one that we sold ourselves into slavery to. Does this make sense? We don't think this way. Most of us. We tend to think, I'm an American, I just do whatever the hell I want. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You either are Lord, or you're either, here's the paradox, you're either a slave to Jesus, which is the only way to become free, or you're a slave to the enemy, who has one end, death, your destruction, slavery, misery, Anger, bitterness, resentment, lust, mistrust, all those things. You live in one house or the other. Jesus comes to take you from the one house, bind the strong man, bring you into his house, his father's house, his father who is rich in mercy and who is oh so loving. And who says, mine. Not like mine, but my daughter, my son, my beloved. Okay? So here's the way, um, here's the way the Lord's been trying to talk to me about this. I have no idea how I got here other than I think the Lord inspired it because I wouldn't even know where to begin to look for something like this. So I'm praying with this imagery uh, a couple weeks ago. Anybody ever heard of an ambush predator? Anybody? There are creatures who are classified as ambush predators. So they lie deathly still. Some of them are under the water. Some of them are, you know, insects. Some of them are snakes. I mean, there's all sorts of different varieties, right? But that's how they're classified. So they just lie still. They're camouflaged so as to attract their prey. And then as the prey gets close, the ambush predator pounces on the prey and it destroys it, right? It eats it. So Jesus, I said, is not the hunted. Holy Week is not about Jesus being hunted. Holy Week is about Jesus hunting. That's what's happening. He is the ambush predator. How? Because God, so as to rescue his most precious creation, that is to say you and me, the only thing that he's made in his image and likeness, the only one that he's called for friendship in the way that you and I are called to, even after we had sold ourselves into slavery to our arch enemy, God, out of love for us, camouflages himself. He takes the form of a slave. He becomes a man. He takes a human nature to himself so as to invade a kingdom. He goes behind enemy lines into occupied country to rescue his people. And on the cross, he allows himself to be pinned so as to capture his prey. See, it looks like he's immobile there. Right? But you can't nail God to a cross. 
Where are you going to get that nail? The only way God can get on a cross is if he wants to be there. He's there because he wants to be there. So Satan's looking at Jesus going, okay, this is a remarkable man. I've never seen a man quite like this. He doesn't sin. He's got some pretty extraordinary power. But the game's up, son. You're about to be mine. Because no one escapes death. And you're dying. And soon you will be mine. That's how it appears. You with me? Does this make sense? <laughs> See, what he's doing is God is um, making himself the bait. So that death will come to him. He's hunting death, capital D. He's hunting sin, not our personal sins. He's making atonement for our sins, yes, but he's hunting the kingdom and the dominion of sin so that it will come to him, thinking that it will claim him. We can't claim him. He's Lord. He's hunting Satan, who at the very moment when he thinks he's one, so pictures one thing eating another, right? This is in a, an image, but it's helpful for me. So picture death or hell or Satan as a, as a, in a personification that can eat the Lord, all right? And so we swa they, they swallow him, and it looks like he's been consumed. No, in fact, what he's trying to do is to get inside <laughs> so that he can explode from within, so that he can destroy what thought it was, in fact, the predator, but is not. It's just the prey. That's what Jesus is doing. Does this make sense? This is an extraordinary image, people. <laughs> Jesus is getting, is going after our enemy. It's not his enemy. He's got no enemies. He's not afraid of anything. He's doing this all out of love for you and me of people who are powerless against the enemies of sin and of death and of hell and of Satan. And so out of his love, out of his kindness, out of his compassion, so that what is his, which has been in bondage, can be made free, he takes the camouflaged form of a pinned man. He's a real man. But he's God, hidden under the appearance of man or in human flesh. And at the very moment when death thinks it's going to win, death loses. And this is what it is that's going to become revealed as we celebrate the Easter Vigil. And this is what it is that he's going to do in your lives who are going to get baptized. He's going to grab you. He's going to free you from sin. That's what water does. Huh? It's a special kind of sign. It makes happen what it signifies. It's going to wash all the sins away. But the other thing it's going to do is it's going to give you access to power now to resist the enemy. It's not a de declaration that the war is over for you. <laughs> I wish it was. Rather, it's the promise that you actually have a chance to win now. Because he'll be in you. The one who has no rival, the one who has led sin and death and hell and Satan in procession, humiliated, stripped, disrobed, and shamed behind him, who is the Lord. And then those of us who are going to be confirmed, or those of you to be baptized and confirmed, the whole point, right? So confirmation, the, the sign of confirmation, huh? the oil is going to go on your forehead. So oil, those of you who are on retreat, remember what the oil is a symbol of? Or not, not so much a symbol of. It was used, especially in ancient times, for a certain kind of people. So as to attract them. Anybody remember? And then as the prey gets close. John. Set apart. Yeah, but so, um, yes, this is like Father Dave said this morning at Mass. This is that part of the, of the moment where I'm trying to get you to guess what I'm thinking. Um, athletes used oil 
So before an athlete goes into competition, they just limber up with oil. Before a wrestler goes out to wrestle, especially in ancient times, they would load up with oil, right? It's harder to get me. That's the idea behind confirmation. I'm getting covered with the Holy Spirit. Why? For battle. To go out, to fight, to engage, and to proclaim who it is that's done this on our behalf. So the, the whole point of confirmation, right? Baptism is for me. Confirmation is for others. Baptism is to free me from my sins and to give me access to the power to overcome the kingdom of sin and the kingdom of death and the kingdom of hell. Confirmation is to drive me out into the world which is in bondage, in decay, doesn't know it, especially in this country, where again we think that we're our own, I'm captain of my own fate. No, you're not. <laughs> That's why, again, you do the things you can't stand doing. And so do I sometimes. You're not captain of your own fate. You're a slave, <laughs> apart from God. And so we're sent out by the Lord from the very place where the victory of his cross and resurrection is made present in the Mass to tell others of the one who, out of love for us, fights for us so as to rescue us. So the grace that God wants to give to us this week, I think, is hope and confidence. This is how much you matter. That God would allow himself to in, wouldn't allow himself, he would willingly do all this for us. He would hunt in this fashion for us against those things against which we are powerless so as to rescue and to liberate us. Make sense? That's what this week's about. So my, my encouragement in a really simple way is just to continue to pray in front of a cross and to ask Jesus, Jesus, help me to understand what you are doing there for me. And those of you who are about to be baptized, it's helpful to like pray as if your hands are chained in front of you. Because that's the condition, actually. I'm just stuck. And God's going to shatter the chains and give you access to new power so that you can live a new life. The life that leads to freedom and to hope. This is why the gospel is good news, people. So there's three figures on the stage, not two. It's not God and us, and gosh, I hope we respond well. Uh -uh. It's God, us, and the enemy. Otherwise, this makes no sense whatsoever, which is why a lot of us have a hard time entering into the mysteries of Holy Week. We neglect. I don't want to give the enemy too much attention, but if you don't understand the enemy, you don't understand what's going on here. But this whole reversal of Jesus isn't getting hunted. No, no, no. He's hunting is really important to grasp. He is the true strong man who's stealing back what should belong in his father's house. No, no, so oil's put on your forehead. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's what's going to happen. So oil's put on your forehead, and it's, it's symbolic. It's the head, so it's the place of reason and of right thinking, so it symbolizes the entire person, right? So it's, we're not going to pour oil over you. In fact, you, shouldn't, you should just let the oil dissolve because it's a, it's a sacrament. So um, don't wipe it away. Um, don't put it on a Kleenex and throw it out. Um, just let it dissolve into your skin. Guys, don't wear any makeup on Holy Saturday, okay? Sisters, <laughs> marginally. <laughs> it's going to be dark anyway. Who cares, right? No one's going to see you. Um, <clears throat> at least for half the ceremony. And you take pictures afterwards. Yeah, but we'll Photoshop them. Don't worry. <laughs> Do people grasp the concept? Yeah, I don't think most people have, actually. I mean, a lot of it's really been, in, um, 
a set of it has been inspired by this book I've been reading all throughout Lent called The Crucifixion. But, um, and then it's just the fruit of prayer, you know, but I, I just feel like the Lord is so, especially the turning on its head of the hunted and the hunter uh, is really helpful for me. Um, and the image of, and the language of Jesus is in an agony. He, that is to say, he's in an arena, as opposed to he's some fearful. I mean, men have approached death with greater calm than Jesus. But this is not a man cowering in fear. This is the greatest athlete of all time going to battle in the decisive battle for humanity. So what I would suggest is that we don't read Scripture that way, that we read Scripture with a companion next to it, like a, some, a good source that we know we can trust and say, not so much to... So, um, has anybody ever read... Anybody ever seen the, um, the PBS series based on the works of Charles Dickens? There's a series that PBS made, which is... Um, so it's like a... It's, a, it's as if... All these characters in five, six, seven, eight different Dickens novels live in the same neighborhood, and they interact with each other. It's actually extraordinarily creative. Well, I know some Dickens, but I haven't read that much Dickens. So I'm watching this, and I'm looking stuff up online going, who is this person? And what's, what's the background here so that I can understand more deeply and enter more deeply into the drama, okay? When you were in high school, you read Cliff Notes. That's why. I didn't read the text. I want to read the Cliff Notes that tells me what I would have learned, maybe, if I read the text, right? Remember those? So, so with Scripture, we want, to, we want to not only have the Bible, but we want to go, I need to find a companion next to me. Might be a few weeks ago, I think I mentioned Mary Healy's commentary on, on the Gospel of Mark, for example. So um, it's upstairs in our library. You can, you can take a look at it. It's about that thick. There's a series called The Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture, edited by a woman named Mary Healy and a man named Peter Williamson. It's the greatest companion to read in Scripture that I know of. Her volume on the Gospel of Mark is one of the greatest commentaries on Scripture I've ever seen. It'd be where I would start. And so I just maybe set a goal for yourself. I'm just going to read the Gospel of Mark over the summer, but I'm going to read it with her commentary. Healy, H-E-A-L-Y. And then as I read it and I see all these things that she's pulling out, I'm going to go, wow, what else don't I know? And then anybody who loves, you always want to know more. So the people who don't care about, I really don't want to know about you. But people we love, like, I want to know everything. Like, what's your favorite color? Right? You like ice cream? You know? <laughs> so when we love, we want to know more. And so this whole experience that we've been going through all these months has been trying to understand more profoundly the love that God has for you so as to what? So as to arouse our love for him. So if I love him, I want to know everything I can. So this is the letter he wrote to me. I want to know everything about this letter. I want to, I want to mine it for all I can. And I want to go back to it over and over and over again. Just like you would read... You know, like I pull out letters from my dad that he wrote me when he was alive. He hasn't written me since he died. Just make that clear. Um, but I pull them out. I just read them again and again and again. Why? They're from my dad. They mean everything to me. And so I can see his handwriting and I can hear his sentiments. That's what scripture is. This is a letter from my father. So I want to linger over it. I want to learn to linger over it. This isn't a rule book. This is a love letter filled with all sorts of stories about my family and yours. And I want to know everything about my family. And so you find those other friends who can walk alongside us to help us understand more deeply what's in here. Okay? Don't be frustrated by that. Actually be encouraged by that. So a friend of mine's a, um, he just passed away um, a few months ago, but he was a philosophy professor at university. And when he was a young professor, he walked into a library and there was all these books and he looks at all these books in the library and he just felt like not so much a failure, he felt um, frustrated like, oh, I haven't read 
any of these. Like, I thought I was a pretty educated man. I haven't read any of these. And then he walked in another day and he says, he felt like the Lord gave him this image that the library was like a garden. And it was full of all these flowers. And rather than be frustrated, it was like the Lord just said, why don't you just enjoy that flower today? And look at it and smell it. And the next day, come back for another one. And another one. And another one. So don't be frustrated by it. See it instead as a place that you can just keep returning to, to feast on beauty and on goodness and on love and on truth. In general, there are two senses of Scripture. There's the literal sense and the spiritual sense, which then is further subdivided. The literal sense is, what is the author actually saying? That's the first thing you have to tackle. If you don't get that right, you get everything wrong. But what is he actually saying? And then, and there's lots of ways to, to study that, just like you would study the works of Bronte. Like, I don't know anything about that time period, so I need some help. Okay, great. And then, what's, with Scripture, what's the spiritual sense? Like, what's it saying to me now? How does this apply to me now? But I first need to understand what's being said, and then, and then you just... Again, we said this on retreat for those of you who are there, but, but a lot of us, especially some of us who come out of um, certain Christian traditions, we're, we're um, kind of pre-programmed to mistrust our imagination. God gave you an imagination. Use it. So you're not supposed to see black. Let your imagination go. Goodness knows we've used our imagination for evil in our lives, right? I mean, I have. So the, the solution isn't to not use it. The solution is to use it for what it's used for. God gave me that for a whole host of reasons. One of them is to read Scripture and to dive into the scene. And as you dive into the scene, so you read the agony again, and you say, okay, Lord Father showed some things that I've never seen before. I'm asking you to show me something new. So I want to read this, and Holy Spirit, I'm just asking you to give me insights. Help me, to, help me to know what I'm reading. Help me to get it. Help me to get something new here. Help me to know what this has to do with me, what you're saying to me. Because it was written for you. Well, his spirit will respond within me, right? Yeah. Yeah. But God, God's dying to do this, literally, right? He wants you to know him. That's why he came. So. All right. We got lots to look forward to. Remember, what's, what's about to happen, these are, not, these are not ceremonies. These are events. For those of you who, uh, if you haven't listened to, uh, how many people here still have not heard Abbot Jeremy's talks when he was here. I'm not going to yell at you. Just raise your hands high. Okay, so if you haven't, so Abbot Jeremy was here and did our mission a few weeks back. So Abbot Jeremy is um, almost arguably the easiest, or the, almost easily, the best teacher on the liturgy in this country. And one of the best in the world. So he was with us for a few days. There's three talks online from the mission. It would be an, a really, really worthwhile thing. They're, they're like an hour each, right? So work out to them. Go to bed to them. I don't care. Um, listen to them because they will prepare you as, as best as anything that I know of to enter into what it is we're about to enter into, namely that when we come together in Mass and especially in these liturgical celebrations that we're about to enter into, God is acting and he acts most profoundly at the Easter Vigil. That's where he grabs his possession back. That's where all the mysteries of our faith happen in a unique, kind of concise, condensed way. You want to see the church? Come to the vigil. You'll see her in all her glory, in all her multiplicity. So do yourself a favor and listen to those before we get to Thursday and let that kind of be a bit of a means to prepare us again to enter more deeply into these great events. If you just, John, what are they, what are they under on the website? 
YouTube channel? OLGCParish.net backslash YouTube? No. Okay, YouTube OLGC Plymouth. Yeah, so they're there. They're there in video and they're there on audio. Thanks, John. Okay, Driscoll is his last name. D-R-I-S-C-O-L-L. -L. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so go to Google. Google Abba Jeremy and OLGC. Okay. 